This is CBC Vancouver News. Tragic news tonight in BC's battle with COVID-19. A child under the age of two has died at BC Children's Hospital. Also, new travel restrictions are coming in order to stop people from leaving their health authority region for non-essential reasons. People over 40 can now get the AstraZeneca vaccine at pharmacies, and those over 40 in 13 hotspot communities can get vaccinated at special clinics. The ban on social gatherings, events, and indoor dining is being extended through the May long weekend. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Major COVID-19 news tonight and we have team coverage. Dan Burrett will have more on the death of the child from the virus. Isabel Ragam is live in Surrey on the lowering of the eligibility age for the AstraZeneca vaccine. But we begin tonight with Tanya Fletcher on the new travel restrictions. Tanya, these restrictions begin on Friday. Take us through what we can expect. Yes, Friday is when the province will issue new orders under the Emergency Program Act to restrict people's ability to leave their own health authority. Premier John Horgan says this will be monitored and enforced by police through roadside check stops, much like the counterattack program we see over the holidays. It is uh, everyone who drives by. It's not a, uh, what your license plate says. Everybody who goes by will be asked where they're going, where they came from. Uh, and I know at Christmas time when that happens, the vast majority of travelers are quite happy to pause and say, no, I didn't have a drink, and yes, I'm going home. Uh, this is the type of situation we're in. This is not uh, heavy-handed in my mind. So under that, you can be fined. It's unclear yet how much those violation, violation tickets might be. And it really is sticky because look at the way some of the health authorities are divided up, especially in the lower mainland. So you can see it's divided by color. The purple is uh, northern health. You can see on the island, we've got uh, um, island health, the interior health. But look at the lower mainland in particular with Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. You might be wondering if I live in Vancouver but work in Surrey, is that still allowed because they're in separate health authorities? What about if I live in Abbotsford but go to school in Burnaby? What about buying groceries if I live right on Boundary Road? Keep in mind, all of those things I just mentioned are essential reasons to travel, and that's allowed. But crossing regions for, say, recreational reasons is not. And Tanya, also uh, some new travel restrictions involving BC Ferries? That's right. Also, by the end of this week, BC Ferries will stop accepting bookings for recreational vehicles like campers and trailers. And if you've made a reservation, BC Ferries will contact you to make sure your travel is essential and that it's not leisure travel. And all through the pandemic, of course, we've seen extra sailing still added, say, on long weekends to accommodate busier times. That will no longer happen. But the province insists it will not cut off ferry service altogether saying it's key that vessels still be open to maintain critical supply chains. Uh, we need to keep the ferries moving. We need to keep our roads going. We need essential services to continue. And uh, it is not our objective uh, to, uh, to go into a, 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 some sort of a state where we're watching and monitoring everybody's activity. We have done pretty well over the past year, but we have not done enough in the variant world that we now live in. And finally, also new today, tourism operators like hotels will no longer accept non-local bookings for travel that isn't essential. And if you're wondering about that camping reservation you just made uh, that's outside your area, well, provincial parks will also be cancelling those bookings. You will, however, get a refund. All of these measures I just outlined, plus the extension of the circuit breaker we talked about, that's all set to last until the end of the May long weekend. Mike Anita. Tanya Fletcher live for us tonight. Thanks, Tanya. And big news for people over the age of 40 now. BC has joined Alberta and Ontario in lowering the minimum age for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Isabel Ragam is live in Surrey tonight. Uh, Isabel, Surrey, long been a, an area with a very high number of cases, and now it's getting special clinics. Uh, tell us about that. Mike and Nita, there's been long for a long time a huge push to get uh, vaccines targeted in Surrey, and that is finally happening. Well, the province is opening up the AstraZeneca vaccine to anyone above the age of 40 through vaccines or through pharmacies, I should say. They're also opening up uh, special clinics in 13 hotspots to 
fast track that rollout and nearly half of those 13 community hotspots are here in the Fraser Health region. A big jump in the age group now able to get an AstraZeneca vaccine, those between 40 and 65. It um, emphasizes the confidence that we have in the safety of this vaccine and that in this population and that age um, over the age of 40, um, that this is a safe vaccine to get. With the lowering of the age limit, the province is also making clear the risk of blood clots linked to AstraZeneca is extremely rare, about four in a million. Most people in the new age group can get the AstraZeneca vaccine at local pharmacies, but tens of thousands in these 13 hotspots will be able to go to mass vaccination clinics. As we've seen uh, targeted approaches for vaccines in Prince Rupert and in Whistler, and it really did help to contain the spread. So I think it's like when you have a fire, you're putting out the hot spots of the fire to contain it before it becomes an inferno. Surrey is home to six of 13 clinics. I'm going to get the vaccine, but not uh, the what, what they call uh, 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 that one. AstraZeneca? Yeah, AstraZeneca. Everybody wants COVID to end, so there you go. I work in this neighborhood, and yeah, they should. They should. I mean, it's nice to see it's in Surrey, but I mean, I feel like everybody should have a fair chance. Surrey has been the epicenter, unfortunately, for COVID. We need to get it under control and we need to reach those that are the most vulnerable. We know that this makes sense from uh, 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 um, um, a strategic perspective to um, give the most protection to the community independent of their age, because we know while age is one of the biggest risk factors, it's not the only risk factor that we're hearing. Surrey's numbers have been high throughout the pandemic, much of that because of a high number of frontline workers and multi-generational households. The hope is this new approach will help bring down the spread and prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed. Now, while when and where these clinics will open up is still unclear, we're hoping to get those details in the next couple of days. There is announcement today, though, from the province saying if you get a COVID vaccine, any COVID vaccine, you will now be able to get paid three hours off work to get that shot. So good news for many people. All right, Isabel Regam live in Surrey for us tonight. Thanks. We have another stark reminder of the dangers of COVID-19. Today, Dr. Bonnie Henry announcing a toddler has died from the disease in BC. Dan Burrett joins us live with more on this. Uh, so Dan, what do we know about this child? They were not even two years old. They're BC's youngest recorded victim of COVID-19 so far. Dr. Henry says the child had pre-existing health conditions, but stresses it was COVID-19 that eventually killed them. The child lived in Fraser Health and was getting specialized care at BC Children's Hospital. She calls it an unusual event and a reminder of the vicious nature of COVID-19. It is a true tragedy and it's a reflection of the impact that this virus is having across our communities. This was a, unfortunately a child who was not in, in care. Um, they had a number of health issues. They received the best possible care they could at, at Children's Hospital and uh, unfortunately uh, um, COVID took their lives. To say every parent's worst nightmare, absolutely tragic. So for parents of young children, what do they need to know? Well, first, remember, this child did have pre-existing health conditions, and one infectious disease specialist has some important data to share with us. Kids in COVID are still reasonably rare, and I think looking at the, at the data across the province, we're seeing pretty um, few cases of very severe disease that would require hospitalization. Still, their loss is staggering for this child's family. And as Dr. Henry notes, the caregivers who did all that they could to save this toddler. Anita, Mike. All right, Dan, thanks very much. Dan Brewer live tonight in the CBC Vancouver newsroom. And the child was one of eight more COVID-19 related deaths over the weekend as BC records nearly 3,000 new cases. The number of people in hospital has gone up again there are now 441 hospitalized, with 138 of those in critical care. More than 98,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine were administered since Friday. Around 30% of eligible adults have received at least one vaccine dose.
And officers in Vancouver had a busy weekend as the warm weather drew crowds of tens of thousands of people. A number of parks, beaches and restaurant patios around Metro Vancouver were packed to capacity this weekend. Current public health orders allow for gatherings of up to 10 people in the same bubble, but the province does discourage that. Vancouver police say COVID-19 protocols were violated all over, including English Bay, where more than 200 people flocked for an impromptu dance party. 28-year-old man from Surrey uh, was in town. He was celebrating the fact that he had just been called to the bar, the bar association. He uh, came into Vancouver with two friends, um, obviously drank too much and uh, began to instigate physical confrontation or fights with his buddies. Vancouver police say they were stretched thin throughout the weekend and policing the COVID rules was challenging. They plan to review the response to outdoor parties. Well, clearly a lot of information came out of today's COVID-19 briefing with the Premier and health officials and we're going to be breaking it down later in this newscast with a familiar face. Infectious disease expert Dr. Srinivas Murthy will be joining us to talk about the new age eligibility for the AstraZeneca vaccine and if the shot is safe. We'll also ask him about how COVID-19 is affecting young children and if the new travel restrictions will help stop spread the virus from spreading. That's coming up just past 6.30 tonight. The man shot to death Saturday night in Vancouver in front of Cardero's restaurant has been identified as a 31-year-old from Abbotsford. Harpreet Singh Dhaliwal was killed when he was shot outside the restaurant in Coal Harbour. It happened around 8.30 on Saturday. Investigators believe Dhaliwal was targeted. This is Vancouver's fifth homicide this year. We don't believe there is an ongoing imminent risk to the public. However, obviously it is uh, very concerning any time there is gun violence in the city, especially in an area that is so heavily trafficked. This occurred uh, in the busy Coal Harbour neighbourhood, uh, very close to where a lot of people do walk uh, on the seawall and such. Anyone with information is asked to call Vancouver Police or Crime Stoppers if you want to remain anonymous. Well, parents in Vancouver are frustrated. The neighborhood park their young kids have been using for soccer camp is giving them the boot. As Zara Premji reports, the park board says the space is for games only, which aren't allowed during the current health orders. Kicking around the ball and playing with friends, a rare sight for some communities during COVID-19. Parents say this impromptu soccer club has become a safe outlet for kids in this neighborhood near Slocan Park. It's brought our community together at a time when we really need something. This is a perfect example of a community coming together during COVID to do something positive for the community and the kids. But after nearly three months of using this field for kids soccer, Sunday was the last day they were allowed. And the problem is, is we're now being asked to move this whole thing down to Clinton Park, which is over 30 blocks away, because the permit has been denied to use this field. The Vancouver Park Board says that's because the recently renewed playing fields at Spokane Park are grade A fields, which means that only official games are allowed there. Artificial turf fields in grade B fields and lower are permitted for practices, camps and other activities. And added, the reasoning behind the rule is to preserve upgraded fields. 100%. This is a bureaucratic tangle that has absolutely no logic, sense or reason to it. While the kids' soccer camp and practice will no longer be welcome at Slocan Park, their neighbourhood park, they can make a long trek to an approved park. And here at Clinton Park, the Parks Board says this space is a grade B zone, which means it's zoned and permitted for kids to come play, practice and have their soccer camp. Which means, though, parents will have to pack up the cleats and the gear and make the long journey over. Some say they're fearful that means the camp may just come to an end. Because now we've traveled 40 freaking blocks to take the kids there. It doesn't make sense. The Park Board says it is reviewing its procedures and trying to remain agile. But in the meantime, their local park is off limits for practice. I haven't seen an official game here played in two years. So I'm not sure what they're saving this field for. But if it isn't for this, then I really don't know what's the point. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. And Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. A look at the forecast, also an update uh, on the wildfire situation, uh, in particular that uh, wildfire burning near uh, Merritt. Yes, that's right. Uh, getting some new information tonight. Uh, this is really our first wildfire 
of note across the province. Of course, the season started early last week. Uh, this fire is about 18 kilometers northwest of Merritt, about 100 hectares in size. 37 personnel are working on this fire. Uh, take a look at the pictures here. Work continues uh, around the perimeter. Crews are actually uh, performing small hand ignitions to remove the unburnt fuel uh, to help stop it from advancing, but an evacuation alert for properties in the uh, Canford and Miller Estate subdivision was issued earlier today. So really the first, again, wildfire of note. Uh, you can see pictures of the smoke as well that uh, is lingering around the area. So we will definitely keep you posted on this story. And the wildfire season in general, now that it started up, I want to show you the latest wildfire danger rating. Uh, you can see that when we checked in on Friday, most of the province was actually at moderate with some pockets of high coming down in the southern interior. And that's because yesterday, unbeknownst to us in Vancouver, we did get a cold front slide through the Kootenays and that brought some very strong winds. We didn't see a lot of lightning though. So most of the fires or all of the fires that we have now are human caused, but that did bring down fire danger rating because of the drop in temperatures and some precipitation. But as we know, it will not take long for that to turn around. I imagine tomorrow, most of that grain will be back up to yellow. And that's because we are still under this summer ridge building right back in behind that front for eastern BC. Uh, current temperatures right now, high teens for YVR. It's slightly cooler in through the valley. And as they take you through the overnight, temperatures are maybe one to two degrees cooler over the next couple of days. It is still a very summer-like forecast. It's just because it's cooler in the interior, we're slightly cooler out here on the coast. I bet you all want to know when it's going to end. So I will have those details coming up. <laughs> we uh, don't look forward to that. <laughs> Thanks, Johanna. You're welcome. Well, Ramadan is a month of faith, prayer, and reflection in the Muslim community. It's also a time to give back. Across BC, community members have organized food drives for the less fortunate. As John Hernandez reports, the giving comes at a time when many families need it most. Oh, no. A prayer just before sundown outside the Masjid al-Salam Mosque in Burnaby means another day of fasting nears its end. It's one week into the Islamic month of Ramadan, usually a time where many people from the community practice their faith together. But for the second year in a row, the pandemic has kept them apart. The pandemic has impacted a lot of communities, but it has also impacted the Muslim community um, because of closures and Friday's Jamaat prayer closures as well. But leaders aren't letting that get in the way of one of the biggest pillars of Ramadan, giving back. Today, 100 warm meals were handed out at this mosque, an annual three-day campaign to give relief to those in need. This is important because, you know, we're continuing the tradition uh, in a different way. We're making a new tradition and, you know, it's, it's keeping everyone kind of together, even though we can't physically be together, but, you know, emotionally, spiritually. They are supporting us mentally here. So we are feeling a bit uh, supported by the mankind. Similar drives have been organized by the community group Ismaili Civic, which is raising money and groceries for food banks across the province. This is our way to give back in a way that is safe, and it's um, adhering to provincial health guidelines. So it's really an exciting time actually for, for people to be able to feel like they're doing something. Volunteer Shalina Dilgear says demand is up this year with many families hit hard by the pandemic. We've been told the lines are getting longer. Um, people who not necessarily were standing in those lines pre-pandemic or maybe in the first or second wave, we're now seeing them. And we want to make sure that as a community we're there to support um, those food banks. Trying times that have put indoor religious gatherings off limits. But each meal here, a reminder that the ties that bind still hold strong. John Hernandez, CBC News, Burnaby. You know, we talk about this often, but it's really nice to see uh, everyone coming together during the time of the pandemic. You can't celebrate or, uh, or pray how you normally would, yeah. but you're giving back. You gotta figure out a way around it. Mm -hmm. All right, a reminder, you can always watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. The federal government has unveiled its first budget in two years. Just ahead, what it'll mean for your finances. Six nineteen on this Monday evening. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Well, a new program in New Brunswick is helping youth find their footing on skateboards while getting their hands on some gear.
Craig Vezina started Skate at Forward Fredericton about a month ago, donating used skateboards, shoes, and safety equipment. And as Gary Moore discovered, the program is taking off. Uh, Skate at Forward Fredericton is a community outreach program that puts skateboards in the hands of deserving children. I started just giving skateboards away to kids of people that I knew, and then I met a teacher who works at the middle school who came up with an idea and he said he asked me if we could find 20 skateboards to create an outdoor class so we could teach the basics. I thought it was a really good idea. I started raising funds to try and, and get these boards. And so that's one aspect of it. The used skate gear portion, I gave away everything I had and then I knew that other friends of mine had boards that they could give too. So uh, I got some equipment from other friends and I put it all together. I refurbished some boards. I fixed up some bearings and some wheels and trucks. I put it all together and I gave it to some kids down at the park. And then it grew from that. The look in a child's face when you give them a free skateboard is something you cannot explain to people. It is, it is unbelievable, that feeling. I've cried many, many good tears since I've started this program. What I didn't expect, parents were taking to social media and were thanking me, and, and I thought, this could be something that I do. It really uh, puts a smile on my face, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that he's, he hasn't smiled this much in a long time. It was just really awesome how he's taken time out of his day, saying that he has a full-time job and he's doing this, giving boards to kids in need that don't have them. Uh, he gave me a brand new skate park board with a skate park on the deck, the new one actually. Uh, I've been down here mostly every single day. Really glad that he did give me a board because it gets me more active and able to come over. He's a good man. He's a very good man and it makes me, it gives me hope. It gives me hope to see that people, there's some really good people out there with really good intentions, right? It makes me smile. It does, it honestly does. There you go. What do we, what do we call the shoot? Kicks, right? Uh, I don't know if that's what we call them anymore. <laughs> I, I think that's... But sure, Mike. Yeah, exactly. Uh, skateboard shoes, right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's uh, uh, good stuff. Okay, uh, federal budget day today. Uh, lots in there, big spending plans from the Liberal government. And we're going to tell you what it all means for your personal finances. That's uh, still ahead tonight. Stay with us. Finance Minister Christian Freeland has unveiled the first federal budget in two years. Billions of dollars have been promised to help rebuild the economy. But as Olivia Stefanovic reports tonight, the Liberal minority government still needs a nod from across the aisle. Facing the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, the federal government is responding with an arsenal of new money. Some will say that we're spending too much. To them, I ask this. Did you, you, did you lose your job during a COVID lockdown? The budget is 700 pages full of promises, including a little something for everyone. But it's clear Christia Freeland, the country's first female finance minister, is trying to help one group hit hardest by the pandemic. After 50 years of talking about it and fighting for it, we're finally going to get it done. Freeland is pledging $30 billion over five years to create a nationwide early learning and child care system, and more than $8 billion a year after that to keep it running. As a working mother, let me tell you, the reality for every working mother is the sad reality. Most women end up bearing the brunt of the child care work. 
The plan, based on Quebec's model, would slash regulated daycare costs in half by next year and charge as little as $10 per day by 2026. And that, of course, means higher economic potential, more people uh, in the workforce. To help Canadians who are struggling to get through the crisis now, the budget pledges more than $12 billion to extend pandemic supports, such as the wage and rent subsidies until the fall, then pivot to a green economy. All of these measures will be adding to the existing $354 billion deficit. The government says it can afford to spend this much because of low interest rates. But it also says there can be no economic recovery without a public health one first. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, the official opposition party leader was quick to criticize the budget. Aaron O'Toole says it doesn't do enough for struggling Canadians. This budget does next to nothing to secure the Canadian economy. Unemployed Canadians hoping to find work, workers who've had their wages cut due to lockdowns, and families hoping for lower taxes to pay down their mortgage or to save for their children's education, they're all going to feel let down by this Liberal budget. And that same budget is also promising affordable childcare. And advocates here in BC are welcoming the news. This is a long time coming. This is very good news. This is going to be substantive change in our country. Um, lower fees, better wages for educators, and more nonprofit spaces. So, this is a, a very good news investment from the federal government. $30 billion has been pledged over five years and $8.3 billion a year afterward to create and sustain child care programs. The budget says Canadians will start seeing their child care costs cut in half by the end of 2022. It forecasts the average cost of daycare will drop down to $10 a day by 2025 or 2026. Well, Inter-provincial borders have been shut down between Ontario, Quebec and Manitoba. Here is a bird's eye view of the border between Ontario and Manitoba. Police checkpoints went up today as part of the Ontario government's plan to stop the spread of COVID-19. A similar scene in Quebec at the Pont Fortune crossing just west of Montreal heading into Ontario. But police officers are also now stationed on all five bridges between Ottawa and western Quebec. As Stu Mills reports, many people across the region are calling the restrictions unfair. You'd have to go back to before the pandemic to see a day with this many commuters stuck on the bridges. With so many public servants on both sides of the border still working from home, this kind of commuter chaos hasn't been seen for over a year. But today, hundreds of drivers inching along, many going nowhere, all of them feeling that way. Frustrating. <laughs> Uh, I don't think there's a definite need for it, to be honest, so. Sylvie Belrive took to Twitter to voice her frustration. The nurse lives in Gatineau, just 17 kilometers away from her job at the Ottawa Hospital. Today, that commute took her an hour and a half. We're very tired and makes me feel like uh, I should quit or retire. It's not just Quebec residents struggling to get to their jobs in Ontario. Michael O'Connor lives in West Quebec. That means he can't visit his family in Ontario. I frankly can't stand it. My um, daughter's expecting a baby, you know. Likewise, he's angry that people in Ottawa who enjoy the beauty of this federal park as much as he does cannot. It's just nonsense, as far as I'm concerned. Ottawa police will only be allowing people to cross for work, medical care, transporting goods and exercising Indigenous treaty rights. This woman lives in Ottawa, but her daughter-in-law lives across the river in Gatineau. That woman is expecting a baby any day now, a Gatineau baby that is supposed to be delivered by the woman's Ottawa doctor here in Ontario. She wonders if they'll need a police escort if the baby arrives at rush hour. I, I do believe that closing the bridges and making it harder for people to go across is trying to solve a problem that does not exist. But whether people like it or not, these travel restrictions are in place for now. So crossing between the two cities that many regard as one 
will be complicated, difficult and slow until Ontario decides it's safe again. Stu Mills, CBC News, Ottawa. Still to come tonight, we sit down with Dr. Srinivas Murthy to talk about all the big COVID-related news in BC today, including why he feels if you're eligible now for the AstraZeneca vaccine, you should take it. Good evening. The NHL season is officially on ice. The players aren't playing anymore. They're hitting team owners with the biggest stick they've ever carried, a full-scale strike. Three games scheduled for tonight have already been cancelled, and with the Stanley Cup playoffs scheduled to begin a week from tonight, one of the great traditions in Canadian sports is in real danger. Our coverage begins tonight with the CBC's labour specialist, Alan Garr. The message was clear. Accept this final offer or walk. The man leading the players union into its first strike put it simply. And the stern faces of the players on the podium this afternoon gave him good reason to be confident. The vote results prove the player dissatisfaction with the owner's final offer. That offer was rejected by a vote of 560 to 4. It is a strike vote that most union leaders couldn't even hope for. Players who were supposed to face off on the ice tonight now stood shoulder to shoulder. They put aside their dreams of a Stanley Cup victory for the more pedestrian goal, to get a better deal. So I don't feel very good about being on strike at all. It's something that goes against the grain, I think, for all of us. This will pass, and, and uh, uh, I think we'll have a better game for it. We were, we've been prepared for this for over a year now. Bob was uh, really good. He informed us all over the issues. He told us to save our money. So if you haven't saved, um, it's, you can only blame yourself for it because we knew this was coming. Everybody behind us. Veteran player Brian Trottier reassured his younger colleagues they are just barely men and they still have their whole careers ahead of them. It didn't take long for team owners to get the message. And this statement from NHL President John Ziegler, read by a spokesperson. It is with a deep regret that I advise that effective 3.01 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, April 1st, 1992, today, I have declared the 1991-92 NHL season suspended on a day-to-day -day basis until further notice. Owners and managers across the country were simply grim. I really don't think that some of these players understand the full ramifications of what's going to happen to this. Hockey in Canada is in danger of becoming extinct as we know it. By early evening, the owner's bargaining committee was already back in Toronto to meet again with the players. But four hours later, it was over for the night. Uh, until you come to an impasse, which um, we may be getting close, all of the issues are out there for discussion. These talks seem to be going nowhere in a hurry. In fact, both sides have now hardened their positions. Members of the owners' bargaining committee say they're still not willing to move, and the players' union says that concessions it was willing to make in order to avoid a strike now may no longer be on the table. Alan Gar, CBC News, Toronto. Tragic news tonight in BC's battle with COVID-19. A child under the age of two has died at BC Children's Hospital. Also, new travel restrictions are coming in order to stop people from leaving their health authority region for non-essential reasons. People over 40 can now get the AstraZeneca vaccine at pharmacies, and those over 40 in 13 hotspot communities can get vaccinated at special clinics. The ban on social gatherings, events, and indoor dining is being extended through the May long weekend. And Susanna De Silva has more now on the death of BC's youngest COVID-19 victim. It is a true tragedy, and it's a reflection of the impact that this virus is having across our communities. One of the latest victims of COVID-19 in BC is also the youngest. 
a child under the age of two. Though this child had pre-existing health conditions that complicated their illness, it was the virus that caused their death. A stark reminder of the worsening situation in BC hospitals that today prompted the province to move beyond current recommendations not to travel. And there will be consequences if you are outside of your area on non-essential business. The province promises people will be checked when traveling between health regions, calling them random audits, similar to drunk driving roadblocks with no extra police powers. But the order and many of the details won't be announced until Friday and after consultations with racialized communities. This is not uh, heavy-handed in my mind. It's random and it will be uh, done in a way that includes everyone at a particular place at a particular time. Similar checks will also happen at the BC-Alberta border, along with signs telling Albertans they aren't welcome. Tourism operators are asked to cancel bookings for anyone outside their area, while BC ferries will stop taking bookings for recreational vehicles. I wish we had taken the chance to avoid variants of concern establishing themselves in BC in the first place. I think we did miss the boat on that. But I do think the best we can do to curb their transmission now through our own individual actions around socializing, also through restrictions on travel. Also today, the bans on indoor dining and some fitness activities were extended another five weeks. Officials hope two-thirds of adults will have their first dose of the vaccine by then and the province's pandemic situation will have improved. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. And millions of Canadians over the age of 40 are racing to book AstraZeneca vaccine appointments today with several provinces, including B.C., lowering age requirements. And now CBC News has learned the federal recommendation on AstraZeneca is changing. Christine Burak breaks that story for us tonight. The recommendation for who should get the AstraZeneca vaccine is changing again. Documents obtained by CBC News show NACI, a national advisory committee on immunization, plans to announce tomorrow the AstraZeneca vaccine may be offered to people over 40 in areas where COVID-19 activity is very high, which it defines as six or more daily cases per 10,000 people. But most provinces aren't waiting for the official guidance. Previously, it was restricted only to uh, older Manitobans, uh, but now will be available to everyone 40 and up. Same goes for Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario and British Columbia. Experts say the rare blood clot risk associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine is now much more clear. You have a much higher probability of something bad happening to you when you drive or you walk across the street than you do getting these vaccines. Researchers examined the medical records of over half a million COVID patients in the United States. They found the same rare blood clot, cerebral venous thrombosis, or CVT, occurred in 39 out of a million patients. In Americans who've received the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, it was reported in four in a million. And the European Medicines Agency has estimated the risk of CVT after the AstraZeneca vaccine is five in a million. That should give people enormous confidence that we are truly monitoring these things and it's not just, uh, you know, get the vaccine and shut up kind of scenario. Okay. Okay, then we'll vaccinate. This pharmacist counsels anyone with concerns about the AstraZeneca shot, but... People are becoming more aware of the fact that four in a million is a very excellent safety profile for medication. With more contagious variants driving cases, this man in his 40s is tired of waiting. I think it should have been done earlier, but now that it's open, I want to get my, my vaccine as soon as I can. In some provinces, the risk from this virus is rising by the day. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Lots of COVID-related news coming out of British Columbia today. So joining me now is Dr. Srinivas Murthy to talk more about sort of the big three items we heard today. Let's start with the AstraZeneca. So people over 40 can now get that vaccine. We've already seen people who were previously eligible choose not to get the shot out of fear. So we want to ask, is it safe? Can you break down for us the risk benefit here? Sure. And yes, it is safe. And I'm confident about that. I think what we can really rely on is the fact that we've been watching the data from around the world and seeing what's emerged and the rate that we're worried about of this special clot. And it's a pretty rare thing, somewhere in the two to five per million doses administered. And there's been millions and millions of this vaccine administered around the world. And so with that pause we've seen over the past few weeks, um, they've accumulated data and come to the conclusion that it's safe. Remember, the rates of 
having a clot is about similar to the rates of dying this year from falling off a ladder, for example. And we all climb ladders still, probably. I think I heard somewhere today you have a higher chance of dying from um, being hit by lightning than dying from this. Is that correct? Something along those lines, yeah. Okay, today, sadly, we also learned of the death of a child under the age of two. You work at BC Children's. What are you seeing in terms of kids in COVID? We're talking people under the age of 19, but, you know, as young as somebody who's a baby. Yeah, sure. So kids in COVID are still reasonably rare. And I think looking at the, at the data across the province, we're seeing pretty um, few cases of very severe disease that would require hospitalization. Um, as I think everyone knows, the ICUs across the province in the adult hospitals are, are remain full or close to full. Okay, finally, new travel restrictions being brought in into British Columbia. The main way of policing this seems to be roadblocks. Are you confident that keeping people in their community will stop the spread of COVID-19? Or is there something else that you think needs to be done? Yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I guess, concerned about how that random auditing or roadblocks will function across our province. I think um, stopping people and asking for documents as to how you are traveling and where you are going is a, is a cumbersome process and is, is very prone for bias. And, uh, and I have concerns about it. So we'll see what happens over the coming days as the policy gets rolled out. Will it slow down the spread of disease? I think um, keeping people reasonably close to their neighborhoods is a good thing. The challenge is how do you enforce it? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that uh, concern about bias? Because Premier John Horgan did touch on that. He said he's working with the BIPOC community to make sure that this is done properly. But what are you concerned about here? Like, I think the history of police or authorities stopping people randomly is not a good one here in Vancouver, at least in British Columbia or Canada more broadly. And I think changing that in a very quick time frame is unlikely to happen, despite those consultations that have happened. Dr. Srinivas Murthy, thank you so much for your time today. No problem. Well, booking your vaccine appointment online can be a challenging task. So a group of young Canadians is volunteering its time and web-savvy ways to help out. As Kayla Hounsell explains, they call themselves the vaccine hunters. Good girl. Andrea Curry was thrilled to hear Alberta is lowering the age of eligibility for the AstraZeneca vaccine to 40. Never been so glad to have passed 40 in my life. But like many Canadians, she found getting an appointment wasn't easy. So she turned her attention to Twitter and Vaccine Hunters Canada. I just said uh, online appointments available um, at this pharmacy and then it had a screenshot and a link. So I clicked on the link and then we were booked. I kind of just found it online. It was pretty organic. <laughs> 27-year-old Joshua Kalpin got involved after he used the service to book appointments for family members. He's a software developer and now runs the site with three other young people. We're trying to facilitate Canadians helping each other get vaccine appointments. Here's how it works. Anyone, anywhere in the country can share information about available appointments and vaccine hunters will share it on their social media channels. They also try to point individuals in the right direction. The Twitter account is exploding in popularity, with well over 90,000 followers, many of them signing up after news of AstraZeneca's expansion. It was literally a party on Twitter last night. We, we had a vaccine party. Today, their work even got a shout-out from a Saskatchewan Member of Parliament. I'd say to every member in this house, visit at Vax Hunters Can to see the good work that is being done in each of your communities by these outstanding young Canadians. Some suggest the government should be paying the vaccine hunters. Not necessary, they say. We're doing this because for the good of the country and to help the country. And that's reward in itself right now. Andrea Curry and her husband will be vaccinated within a couple of days. I just say a heartfelt thank you. I think um, we all owe you, you know, a debt of gratitude. She says for her family, it was a valuable tool to help Canadians take one more step toward normal. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, there's a special place in Abbotsford that's best known for one thing. It's dark, really, really dark. Who that draws and why they're there coming up. Vancouver City Hall, 12th and Cavi, looking south up Cavi from our camera atop the CBC in downtown Vancouver. Beautiful Monday evening at 6.43. Boy, it sure has been nice. I think maybe June we'll get our come up and I don't know. Joe will let us know if that's going to happen and have the uh, more short term forecast just ahead.
The Market Update is brought to you by Desjardins, rated number one financial institution in Canada by The Banker Magazine. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Mm -hmm. It's a hard word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Joe, it was a pretty tough weekend. I don't think anybody got outside. So much rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, speaking of tough, uh, tough things, it was a tough weekend. Yep, you're right. That's not true. Everyone <laughs> was out in full force. And uh, it really was more reminiscent of July and August. I've heard a few people say uh, that uh, it was even better than a summer weekend because we didn't have the bugs or the smoke or the oppressive overnight. So hope everyone found a way to enjoy it. It's not done yet. I want to take you to the current temperatures uh, across the country because we still have a ways to go. Our high pressure has really sort of squeezed out after that trough, but it's rebuilding and we've got above seasonal and sunshine for the province. Take a look at the temperatures though across the prairies, very cold air still in place, minus one and through Winnipeg, uh, morning temperatures and almost the minus double digits for Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I knew that cold air was headed to the uh, Great Lakes, but, but uh, our producer just asked me to eh, just take a look at the Toronto long range forecast. And yes, snow on the way to Toronto midweek, like, accumulating snow so we can talk more about that tomorrow so just remember that as we share our summer like pictures with our friends east of the rockies lots of sunshine across the province again tomorrow that front uh, that moved through the kootenays actually bringing some very strong winds uh, to parts of the kootenays yesterday that has now moved off 13 in through cranbrook tomorrow 21 for kamloops a 20 in through Kelowna, uh, sunshine all the way up to uh, the north coast. A few clouds sneaking in through Prince Rupert, but high pressure continues to maintain its presence. It is sort of getting squeezed out over the next couple of days. So we're seeing some more high cloud move in through the central coastal sections. By Wednesday, we'll see some high cloud in our forecast. By Thursday, that'll thicken up a little bit. I'm still thinking summer like conditions right through Thursday. It's Friday that we're talking a mainly overcast day and the rain to return for the weekend. Uh, you can see as I take you through the long range forecast, the cooler air moves in just in time for next weekend. I say cooler air, it's seasonal. Our 30 year average for afternoon highs right now about 14 degrees. So we get back down there for the weekend. Not a bad next few days though. So if you get out, can you get it? If you can get out and enjoy it, easier said than done. <laughs> Oh, that's the only thing that's frozen these days. <laughs> Meteor shower. Oh, there uh -oh. we go. Oh, oh uh -oh. no. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's we can not hear a great you. pose you're, to be frozen still, in. Oh, I said you were the only thing that's frozen these you days. You make anything look good, Johanna. It's okay. <laughs> that that is how it, I froze. Well, I'm sorry, every. There we go. <laughs> but I think you were starting to talk about the uh, this meteor shower. Ooh, I was. I'm dancing, sure that yeah. that freeze could have been more embarrassing. So, whew, thank goodness. Yes, the uh, Lyrid meteor shower is in full broom, bloom. This one won't freeze because at its peak, you'll be able to see up to 30 <laughs> meteors an hour burning up in our atmosphere. There we go. The sky watchers in Abbotsford have already staked out their piece of the heavens to watch the fiery display of rock and sand lighting up the sky. Gordon Loverin met with astronomy hobbyists to find out about their special spot in the Fraser Valley. So the city granted this two acres on the east side of McDonald Park for uh, a dark sky preserve uh, and, and that's how it was formed. It was, it was fairly dark before but unfortunately in the last few years lights have continued to encroach and, uh, and it's gotten to be you know, very compromised light wise, very sad that way. Looking at the heavens is, is something you actually developed as a kid, right? I always wanted to be out there. My father, he wanted to go to university and uh, become an astronomer.
it's much like a dirty snowball and that debris, that granular material, that sand gets lost and floating in space and each year we go through that debris so it's not as if the meteor shower is coming to us, it's as if we're going to it. It's just all of a sudden there's nothing and then pssst, uh, a bright streak of light goes flashing by it. and you're always sort of wanting something to explode or something like that. And what happens is this material comes in at such a rate of speed into our atmosphere and it, it basically heats up the nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere and what we see is the glow of those molecules in our atmosphere. That is absolutely incredible mm -hmm. to see. I need to see it in person. Yeah, well, we've got the chance with the clear skies, so if that if that didn't convince you, I don't know what will. It's going to be a great week. And I found a good spot for it. All right, thanks, Joe. He's taken the weather world by storm, but it's not his forecasting that has people excited. The drumming BBC meteorologist and Johanna Wagstaff's answer next. It takes a ferry trip and then a short drive to get to Freeport. The local attractions for the village, usually the whales. But these days, it's the high school basketball team's big win over Shelburne to win their first ever regional title. She goes for the twist around shot! They were like the little engine that could. Things like this just don't happen here. So when it does, it's just even more appreciated. Yeah. Nobody like, expected it. No. And then we did it. <laughs> Two, Coach one. Jessica Timo could barely keep herself composed on the bench when she realized the team that was used to being the underdog was actually going to win. We were just like trying to contain the tears, the smiles, everything. And then when that buzzer went off, they just lost it. <laughs> we all just laughed. Like they laughed, they cried, they hugged. It was truly remarkable. What makes it even more remarkable, this team had no tryouts. The eight players who showed up for the first practice made the squad. Bella Titus, Gracie Frost. <laughs> There's only eight of us and two of them were juniors, so we just showed up at the gym and worked hard and this is what happened. <laughs> yeah. Because no parents or fans were allowed in the gym, leading up to the final, they had a sign-making party and hung them in their school gym to feel everyone's spirit. The parents, meanwhile, nervously waiting in the parking lot, holding on to the signs too. When the game was over, the champs ran out for the hugs and tears in the parking lot. Madison. All of this even oh, more Madison, epic because up until this, this season, there was a whole lot of losing. The first year I started, we lost every game and then going into my grade 12 year, winning every game, it was a pretty big deal. The best part of this story is this. The ferry bringing some players back to Briar Island did a celebratory 360. The cars and trucks on the ferry started blaring their horns to let everyone know the champs were back. There was even a motor parade through the island. The fire department got into the celebration too. The ferry <laughs> did 360s in the passage down here. How cool was that? Pretty cool. We did a little victory run around the island in Westport and honked our horns around. All the community gathered outside. They were waving at us. It was like yeah, a really came, good time. They came out on their decks in the yeah. fire department. They were blaring their horns, and it was it was so great. <laughs> when big things go on in the community, it doesn't matter if it's sports, if it's you know somebody fighting cancer that needs a benefit, anything. The community steps up and they step up big and they support it. Yeah. Yay! So this banner, the first time the school has won a basketball title, will now hang in the gym. The team, all grade 12 starters move on to start the next phase of their life. The two grade 8 players aren't sure if they'll even be able to field a team next season. But this season, it was the stuff of dreams. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Freeport.
A BBC meteorologist has taken social media by storm with his second striking performance of the broadcaster's theme song on his drum kit. Weather presenter Owen Wynn Evans first performed the theme song last year while working from home. The video went viral to the tune of six million views and last week he brought his kit to the studio to perform for viewers on the anniversary of that hit. And while well, Canadian Twitter got involved as it does, encouraging you, Johanna, to throw your hat in the mm -hmm. ring. <laughs> yes, and I decided I wanted the world to see my xylophone skills. Oh. And then some colleagues signed on and things snowballed from there. Take a look. When Amy Bell, who also does weather on occasion out here in Vancouver, tagged me in the BBC drumming, and I thought, what a great chance to show the world my xylophone skills. <laughs> so I posted it, and Lee, Lee and I have worked together on podcasts before out in Vancouver, and we've been trying to figure out a way to collaborate on something. Who knew that it would be a xylophone drumming rendition of the Weatherstone? I took inspiration from the fact that it was originally posted from the BBC drummer. I'm going to pitch it to uh, to CBC Vancouver because uh, it's it's got rhythm. I like it. I feel like I can dance to it. I like it. <laughs> So what do you think? Should we go for it? Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> genius. You were, you were very, very good indeed. Yeah, I think. I he... mean, the real credit is to Lee. I had three notes, but <laughs> he took it and ran with it. I love it. I love it so much. So yeah, yeah I'm glad the world has seen it now. <laughs> Every note is important. All right. Thanks, thank you. Joe. And thank you uh, for watching tonight. Dan Burrett is here at 11 right after the National. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.